Right, so welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have Professor John Wilson today for us for our AI seminars. Uh, John is the director of the USC Special Science Institute. He's the director of what I believe, or I'm not sure if it's pronounced JST. J -S -T. Yes. Yeah, online. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Uh, he has a variety of additional appointments uh, throughout the university. Uh, he has been uh, for uh, uh, two decades or so the founding director of Transaction on JS um, and uh, current editor in chief since its inception. Uh, John is part of the University Consortium for the Geographic Information Sciences, UCGIS, uh, which describes itself as a, the professional hub for the academic JS community in the United States and uh, several partners abroad. Um, and he served on various capacities for over 10 years in this particular uh, consortium. Uh, his research is focused on the human and environmental systems, uh, in particular modeling aspects of that. He is the recipient of a very long list of uh, academic uh, research accolades and awards. Uh, so we are very pleased to have him today. Please join me welcoming him. Thank you. Okay, so I, uh, I moonlight as many things in life, so I'm actually going to talk about how I started my academic career today and, uh, and, and try to pitch what I do off and on for the last 30 years in a context that might, might provide to you some ideas about opportunities uh, for new work and collaboration uh, going forward. Right, so I'm going to... Uh, I just published a book on this topic uh, a few months ago, so I'm going to briefly describe sort of the current state of the art, and then I'm going to talk about uh, replicability and reproducibility in the context of a, of a very narrow sort of uh, piece of this research domain. And then uh, this time at the end, I, I want to talk about uh, future needs and more particularly opportunities a bit more broadly, so you can see how uh, replicability and reproducibility might fit in a context here. Uh, I've been, as I said, I've been doing this kind of work since uh, 1980, well, maybe 1978 uh, until now. Uh, I know a little bit. Uh, I, there's more that I don't know than I know, but I think that the opportunities nowadays, given modern computing infrastructures and algorithms and so forth, is huge. So let me start with the, the current state of the art, uh, maybe general commentary is a term you haven't heard. So just think about it as the science of quantitative land surface analysis. So it's describing the surface of the earth in meaningful terms, and the holy grail would be that you could describe that surface and generate actionable information uh, that, that might guide uh, human, the use and, and or non-use of both human and natural systems. Uh, so what typically happens here is that there is uh, there's reality, and the, the goal is to try and, in this case, represent reality in a computer. And so then there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of things you have to do to do that. I know I'm going to be standing out of the picture for a minute, but I want to see my slide. So you've got to choose uh, one or more elevation data networks to work with. I'm going to show you what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, then you have to somehow sample the land surface. Uh, there's many ways today that you can do that, but almost all of them now use some form of remote, remotely sensed data. Uh, then you're going to create a surface model from those sample types. Uh, good scientists will correct the errors and artifacts in the surface model. Poor ones probably won't. Uh, and then you have a final DEM. Some people are satisfied just to visualize that and to interpret it visually. But most people then are going to do some further analysis on top of that data set uh, and they're going to use it and run it through a series of applications. And I'm just going to talk about two today. And they are typically, the two I talk about are typically never the end result. They are then part of a workflow that, that, that's designed to get that uh, actionable information so that people can make uh, real world decisions. Uh, this workflow was largely unchanged. Uh, I, this is what I had in my mind in 1978. Uh, it's just the ways in which we execute this workflow that have changed, uh, particularly in the last decade. So you need uh, elevation data. When I started 
uh, the holy grail would have been uh, you'd scan or hand digitize a topographic map sheet and generate a, a square grid di digital elevation model of some small piece of the earth at, at a resolution of about 100 meters. Or if you were interested in the globe, as of about 20 years ago, the dream would be that you'd have a square grid of the, of the earth at about a one kilometer grid spacing. Uh, today, we have, at any geographic extent you want, uh, a grid that's sort of a meter on the side, right? And so you can you can rapidly sense then how much more data we have available than 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, and so very rich visualizations are possible in most parts of the world. There are on, ongoing data collection exercises underway. And in many cases, like in the United States, you can have a, a customized product now, like a square grid DEM for the coterminous United States, or you can have the raw data because the thing on the bottom left there is a progress of the USGS uh, LIDAR uh, data set. And so you can have the original point cloud or you can have a DEM made from it. And just out of curiosity, is this created? from satellites or from airplanes or? Uh, it varies depending on where we're talking about in the world, but increasingly it's developed from satellites, right? Uh, and there are competing satellites, so, uh, and there are competing methods and, and, and they get you different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but some of, the, some of the best data lately have been I think collected by the Japanese uh, space agency, but sometimes in, in collaboration with NASA and other US groups. So the, the three traditional networks you use to think about and reason with these kinds of data. Uh, on the left side there, there's a, a contour based network. In the middle is the favorite, which is a square grid network. And then the analysis is done as a, a moving window across that. And on the right is a triangulated irregular network. And, uh, and early on, people worked in one of these three three kind of representations, but typically not two. Uh, but lately, uh, pe people have been using these interchangeably. So there's a lot of work around that as well. Uh, and so what people normally do is they, the, the next thing, when you get to an application, you do one or other of two things. The first one that I'm going to talk about today is that you might try to generate from the digital elevation data or the model, uh, some land surface parameters. Uh, in most cases, the majority of that work has been done on a moving three by three window across a square grid DEM. Uh, and sometimes the land surface parameters are local. Sometimes they're about that three by three moving window. Sometimes they're about a larger area, right? It depends on which ones you're trying to generate. And there are so-called primary land surface parameters that all you need in order to calculate them is the DEM itself. And then there are secondary uh, land surface parameters that either use two or more of the primary uh, land surface parameters and or some additional data. For example, some information about the soil that sits on, uh, on or near the surface, right? So that's, that's one of them. Uh, and the problem that somebody new to this field would have is today, well, at least as of a year ago when I finished my book, uh, I counted uh, 68 different primary land surface parameters. And as I show you in 10 minutes or so, uh, for almost all of those, you need uh, to use slope direction and width and perhaps flow accumulation in order to calculate those things themselves and then other things here. And you have 24 choices there. So conceivably, you have a you have about 24 times 68 options and, and we could probably find somebody that's used each and every one of those options and then published a paper uh, in this domain. And many times you, at first read, you might think, well, everybody's done that. And then you realize that they've used a unique com combination of a particular algorithm in order to generate one of these 68 outcomes. And then the, the secondary land service parameters are perhaps more useful and same time more complicated, but they typically revolve around these two outcomes. So one is that we want to characterize water flow and soil redistribution on top of the land surface. 
typically natural areas or agricultural land or things like that. And the other one is maybe we want to calculate uh, energy at heat regimes uh, because that has tremendous consequences too for what we can do on a landscape, uh, whether it be to change it and use it to produce something that we find valuable, or even if our motivation was to conserve it or to restore some ecosystem or some function like that. And there's many, many, many tens of papers that have, that have been published around those ideas as well, including some by me. And then the other kind is... Yes. Sorry to interrupt. So I'm a computer scientist yes. and I think most people here Yes, are. I know. I'm going to so. connect this to you shortly. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but I, I want you to connect parameters for me. Yes. So, you know, for us, a parameter is an argument to a function oh, that's yes. computing so, something, right? So, uh, you yeah, know, so are here, these, here, are here. these uh, data? Are these programs? Here. Are these? Yes. Yeah, so here, uh, a parameter in the context of this community would be an outcome. So you start with a square grid that, that is a, an array of elevation values, and you do something with those data, and you produce a new square grid that's some other outcome. So. For example, for every square grid, you could start with elevation values, and then if we <coughs> if we went to we could calculate the slope at each of those points, or we could calculate the aspect. And in, in the language I'm using here, they would be new parameters. So in those cases, those are data products. Yes. Say, new data products, yes. right? But one of those are statistical parameters. So yes. So uh, sometimes you would. Uh, you would use a three by three window, five by five window, and you would calculate the mean elevation, and, and you would ascribe that that value to a particular location in space. Then you'd move the five by five window ten meters or five meters, whatever the grid spacing is, and then you would do that again, right? And so here statistics would be used in a as sort of the opposite if you had some theory. Uh, of how the processes work, and you and you use that to guide uh, how you would derive those new values. Okay. So super, That's super good helpful. question, right? And uh, and why uh, was certain trepidation when I accepted the invitation to talk here today? <laughs> we'll help you. Sorry. We'll help you. Oh, this is not the worst I've ever done. I once went to a meeting where I was I'd worked with a group of soil scientists on modeling non-point source pollution. And so one of the people I worked with was a soil chemist, but they were really interested in the GIS piece. And so I, I gave the opening keynote at a Weed Science Society of America meeting. First surprise, their annual meeting 30 years ago got over 2,000 people. Ever talked to 2,000 people before that moment in my life. Second surprise, I asked for a show of hands of how many people were chemists, because I had never actually took a chemistry class my whole life. It seemed like everybody in the room was a chemist. 95% uh, of the questions I got were about the chem chemistry of, that was embedded in the models we were operationalizing in a GIS. Uh, but the good news was I survived. <laughs> 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 and we got refunded. <laughs> so the other option is that, you know, maybe you, many times uh, people have an interest in describing landforms or collections of landforms. And so the, the earliest work did this visually on top of a printed topographic map. And perhaps the most famous person that did this was this gentleman Hammond in 1964. He published a series of paper map sheets that described all the landforms of the United States of America. A map, huge, huge untaken. What was the resolution of this? Uh, it was never clear because uh, you know he, he basically did it with pen and paper. And, and then drew the reclassification on a, on a sheet of mylar, then had it professionally pr produced, right? So it would have varied uh, with the variability of the landscape, right? So you can imagine on the sides of the Rocky Mountains, it would, the resolution might have been a lot finer than say on the middle of the Great Plains, right? And then people started to do this with a computer. Uh, in the middle here, this group at U United States Geological Survey led by SAYA, have basically done this for all of North America, all of South America, I think Africa and some other parts of the world. Uh, but here's an attempt uh, uh, that took the same ideas that Hammond implemented and described with pen and paper, and then did that with a computer a few years ago. 
And obviously when you do it this way, you get a much better resolution than when you did it over here. Uh, and, and it's a data driven process. And so you, you can do it iteratively as well. Uh, typically these approaches here, what, whether they use this computerized method or they use this paper method over here, they're about uh, identifying objects and then trying to describe the boundaries. And so the, the, the best part of their paper, the description of their method is, well, what do I do with all of the salt and pepper that I see in a satellite image or some other kind of data set? Whereas if you went to sort of uh, image analysis, uh, you, you might uh, first look for uh, uh, contiguous parts of the image that had similar values. And, and then worry about the classification second. And there's a group in Austria that have had some good success with this, and, and they've set about the task of trying to classify land landforms for the whole world, right? And so are we looking at mountains? Are we looking at short, uh, small hills? Are we looking at coastal plains? Are we looking at interior plains or glaciers or what, any kind of landform uh, that you think of? And if you just think of your everyday language, uh, you know, I, I grew up in New Zealand and my PhD advisor at the University of Toronto took me for a field excursion in southern Ontario and he kept talking about hills and mountains. And I was sitting in the car thinking, well, you know, I know you're a very accomplished scientist, but how do you get a drink this morning? I don't really see any hills or mountains. It's virtually flat, right? <laughs> and, you know, from my parents' backyard, I could see Mount Cook in New Zealand, which was 12,349 feet high. Uh, and so that to me was a mountain. Uh, I even have trouble in Los Angeles here thinking about mountains. We have some hills, but and so th this is the challenge then if you're going to try and do this kind of work, right? The other thing is that whether you're organizing and trying to describe the character and the location of landforms or whether you're calculating what I call land surface parameters, it's typically a means to an end. Right, so not many people get jacked about those as outputs unless they want to then use them for something else. And so that, that doesn't have to, but it, but it often then gets wrapped up in thinking about error and uncertainty, right? And so the group at the top there were looking at predictive vegetation modeling for conservation. In other words, let's describe the landscape and then try to imagine what it could support assuming we have some conservation outcomes that we're trying to achieve. And, and they found that the, that the error propagation from the digital elevation data basically made that task hopeless. Tweak a few parameters and you get a totally different prediction of what the outcome could be to the point where not knowing how to tweak those parameters meant that you, no matter what kind of output you produced, was highly uncertain. And others, you know, uh, find tremendous challenges when they get to, like in the bottom case, uh, let's try and model the spatial temporal dynamics of global wetlands, right? And, and think about the methods we would, and data we would use to do that. And until recently, we, we could never have entertained that as an idea, but there are serious groups all around the world now that are trying to do these things, uh, thinking about uh, how to manage and, and anticipate, uh, among other things, the consequences of uh, global climate change. Uh, now, as you'd expect, there's a lot of platforms, right? Uh, some are proprietary, like ArcGIS. Many are open source, like GRASS or QGIS or Whitebox. Uh, these platforms calculate what I've been calling land surface parameters. They can assist and, in many cases, accomplish classification of landforms and other land surface objects. The desirable attributes would be that they have large numbers of tools or tool sets to do this. They have large numbers of GIS functions to help with things like visualization, uh, large numbers of supported data formats and high levels of interoperability. These things over here vary tremendously as a consequence of, of those desirable characteristics. And as you all know, I think you've got to think of, of this today in the context of a whole sort of ecosystem because you're going to have different use cases, you're going to have different user experiences that people are looking for, and you, you want this, the platform, whatever it is, to be extendable. 
meaning you could easily build things on top or call functions. You do it with uh, Python or, or some scripting language or visually, and, and, and this is just a sense of what ArcGIS can do in this space. Now, in this work, and, and this is where I'm gonna try and connect it to you, most people that do this kind of work have to, uh, uh, should ask themselves all these questions and then try and answer them, right? So uh, first, how should the land surface be represented? What's the preferred scale and why? What elevation sources are available and which would work best for the opportunity and or problem at hand? What pre-processing pre is required to produce a usable digital elevation model? How will error get propagated and how should this uncertainty be handled throughout subsequent analyses? What methods and data are best for calculating specific outcomes? Land surface parameters. Uh, there's not universal agreement uh, about any of these things. What methods are best for delineating specific land surface objects? Is there a need to develop new land surface parameters and objects to address particular problems? What approaches and metrics or indices are best suited to a particular mapping application and do methods even exist? And does an adequate model exist or do we need to develop or modify one for the opportunity and or problem at hand? Now, when I present to people that do this kind of work, they're tremendously enthused when I show them all those questions because that's going to keep them busy for another 30, 40, 50 years, right? <laughs> and, and each of them is going to write a paper that gets published that moves the dial a tiny, tiny little fraction, right? And uh, I think you all in this room are quite a bit more accomplished and more ambitious uh, than some of these people here. So one question is that, yeah. um, you know, maybe it's my ignorance yeah. about digital elevation yeah. itself, but I would imagine that it's not a static thing. It's not. <clears throat> and so I don't see anything here that talks about how to track changes in elevation over time, and maybe they're not significant, or maybe they're not useful for. And no, they're the hugely, hugely see. useful. And so that, so back here when we were talking about these systems, uh, you, you know. Uh, if you can connect to a GIS, you, you could easily handle those kinds of things because you, you could build time slices and look at change within a sort of a 3D display very, very easily. Whereas CowDM, for example, is just for the calculation of certain land surface parameters. So that's not going to handle that, that kind of function. An example of where that's hugely important, there's a group at JPL now that are looking at... Uh, one of the GPS satellites and very high resolution GPS. And then on the floor of the San Gabriel Valley, for example, uh, the, the, the elevation is gonna rise and fall with the accumulation or the loss of groundwater, right? And so now you could indirectly use changes in the height of the surface to estimate the volume of groundwater uh, under the surface. And if you were, among other things, interested in sustainable extraction, uh, we have a chance now to calculate what that would be, right? And so that's that's an so that's an example of where the things I'm talking about today are not really the end result, but but many times what I'm talking about is somewhere in the middle of a path that would lead you to those kinds of uh, end results. Can I ask a follow-up yep. question? So yep. um, you mentioned a, a variety of applications uh, yes. and examples like this one yep. of the San Gabriel Valley. I, I wonder how much of that pipeline and the software ecosystem and so on also uh, looks into sort of predictive models that can allow you to, I don't know, get the data, the current data, or historical data, and then model how an effect of climate change uh, would affect you know, elevation or slope. Yes, something. there's lots of papers. So it's part of yes. all of yes. that. Yep, I'm so, going to, towards the end, I'll try and get to that. I'm trying to build a picture. So to give you a sense of, of what might be so difficult here is, here's a paper that was published in Hydrology and Earth System Science a few years ago, and, and they calculated something called topographic wetness index, right? So this is designed to tell you, to, to give you a snapshot or a general picture of, of which parts of the landscape you would expect to find wetter than other parts. So if, you're, if you like hiking or, or cycling in forests, uh, you'll often find a part of the landscape if you've been there many, many times that's, that's always wet. And, and so this, this particular uh, calculation would tell you how to find those wet places as opposed to places that are drier. And so they considered 400 unique approaches that looked at different 
digital elevation model resolutions, looked at different levels of vertical precision, chose different flow direction and slope algorithms, used various forms of filtering so that you got rid of so-called noise. Some of that might have been valuable. Uh, chose to include or not include different soil properties uh, with the goal of comparing uh, the resulting topographic wetness maps, in this case, to observed soil moisture in agricultural fields. And so my point here is that anybody doing this kind of work, in order to answer the questions I showed you before, would have to roll through their head all of these different possibilities before they actually settled on the workflow that they used to get some output. And so what I'm trying to convince you is that traditional way that people do this, the odds that you have the optimal output, maybe not very high, unless the person has a great deal of experience and, and work with, with tuning through all these different uh, decisions. So let's, so this brings me to this idea of replicability and reproducibility. And I'm just gonna focus on one outcome, which is I have a, a digital elevation data and I want to turn that into flow directions. So when water falls from the sky, how much and where is it going to run across the land surface? So I got some definitions, right? So the flow direction is the direction of flow across the land surface. Uh, that turns out that currently, I believe there are 24 different flow routing algorithms that have been uh, used in at least one published paper in the last 30 years. The flow width is the width associated with the flow leaving, in this case, a particular grid cell. Uh, the upslope contributing area is the region from which the water from precipitation is collected. So when you get down to the bottom of a valley, you've got a bigger upslope contributing area than you did on the side of a mountain. And the specific catchment area is the upslope contributing area for unit onto a width, right? And, then, and I'm gonna talk about each of these at different moments. And, and why this might be important. So I took this picture in 1981 when I was a PhD student. Uh, this is Ontario. This is what my PhD advisor called hills. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was already a precursor to climate change because in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, uh, the Corn Belt was, had already begun moving north uh, in part because of how we genetically changed corn as a crop. And so this whole landscape here was used every year to grow corn, most of which was fed to cows, like it is in the Midwest. And uh, uh, corn is a unique crop. It's uh, typically planted in rows that are 24 or 36 inches facing from, from each row. Uh, it takes five or six weeks after you plant the corn before you have any kind of uh, continuous crop cover for a field. And in Southern Ontario, I took these pictures uh, right around the beginning of May, right? So look here, there's white stuff on the ground, snow, uh, really, really wet months. So there was lots of rain and rain means the temperature is above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so there's lots of snow melt as well. So the landscape was really, really wet. This, this is water that either is snow melting or rain that's recently fallen running off an agricultural field. And here's the same field a few weeks later uh, where I show all of the topsoil that's been lost. For a farming, topsoil is money because that's where all of the nutrients are. That's where the best water holding capacity is. And so lose the topsoil and you really lose the opportunity to grow crops unless you then make counter investments in industrial fertilizers and then you apply them and so forth. And in many parts of the world, that's how we do modern agriculture, but in all likelihood, it's not sustainable. So this is a, another use case for trying to characterize uh, what these landscapes would look like and, and obviously then how they behave. So it turns out, if we just think about flow direction, uh, the, the founding paper, the first uh, example of this, I think was produced in 1978 right around the time I started my PhD. And so uh, for the longest time, there was just one way people did this. In a three by three moving window from the center cell, you looked for the path of maximum descent and all the water went in that direction to one of the eight surrounding cells. And so this is why it was called D8. And then in the 1990s, there were 11 new methods for, for allocating flow to the surrounding grid cells that were proposed. Then in the 2000s, there were eight more 
And since 2010, there are four more, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, used in at least one paper. But uh, there are 20 running algorithms. Most of these four have been used many, many times. Uh, and uh, not clear to me in any particular situation which one was best, or in many cases, how the authors picked the flow direction they used. They, back here, they Back here, I notice I have nine that are single flow direction algorithms and 15 that are multiple flow direction algorithms. Single means you go from the center cell in the three by three moving window to one of the other eight cells. Multiple means you could go to one or two or maybe all eight, right? And you could think if you just think of a landscape, situations where you might want to do any and all of those things, right? Uh, so that's the single. Multiple. Sorry, is there an assumption that the quantity is conserved yes. from T? Yes. Okay. So this wouldn't work if you have some sort of dynamic uh, weather condition. We assume that there is even more rain pouring at the next time step that affects the amount of quantity that there is in the originating cell. Uh, well, if you're not at the very top of the drainage, mm -hmm. then you're going to have water coming from above as well as water going out the bottom. So it will be dynamic in that sense. Uh, an example of how this has been implemented, uh, in the US today, we now have a, something called a national water model, and that runs continuously uh, and produces output at varying time intervals in the future. And uh, embedded in that is a way to get uh, both current weather and predicted future weather onto a land surface and then you have to have a flow direction algorithm uh, to move that water across the landscape and in, and for every two kilometer reach of stream in the United States there are predictions three hours ahead, 12 hours ahead, one three days ahead, a month ahead, right? Yes, How do you get soil temperature? Uh, you can get that now from satellite as well. And the other qu answer to his question would be that in many parts of the landscape, water could, could come back from under the ground to the surface. Uh, and so again, uh, I was at a talk yesterday at a conference and uh, somebody from USGS uh, has basically used sort of a GIS framework to estimate antecedent soil moisture on a, on a continuous time dynamic basis uh, for the whole world. Right, uh, and so all, all of these things are, are possible, uh, but, it, but it, it's in many respects the wild, wild west because people are making major decisions sitting in their office manually in their head, and then they're building kind of uh, workflows to support uh, probably what they think is possible rather than what's uh, best. So, so one question is, if you have ground truth, maybe for some areas that they yep. are highly instrumented and you can actually see what's mm -hmm. happening, is there such? Uh, well, uh, let me see if I get back to that and answer that question. It's problematic. Okay. Uh, so here's uh, upslope. So this is a little uh, catchment. Uh, it's about three or four square kilometers. It's in uh, Montana uh, on an agricultural research station. Uh, this is where D8 means that flow went from the middle of a three by three window to the, to the path of steepest descent. Uh, the drainage here is where my finger is. So this is the highest point in the catchment. So down here is the highest point and the water is leaving this uh, catchment here somewhere. And the white then is where you have the largest contributing area. And obviously that in general defines the stream network because the stream the purpose in geomorphology is the stream is collecting the, the runoff and carrying it ultimately to the ocean or to another river, right? So that's one. Uh, now, this guy tar bottom, this is the one, this is the method that's used in the national water model right now. Uh, he had the idea, well, you know, if I look at this three by three window and I take the elevations in the center of those nine cells, then I could calculate a much better estimate of the flow direction than simply just choosing which of the eight cells I dump all the water into. And even though this is typically described as a single flow direction algorithm, it has the capacity, depending on where the flow vector falls, 
to either put water in one cell or two cells, right? And so it means that uh, you you get a slightly different result. You you might have seen on the last one that with D8, there tends to be a lot of water running down the hill in little riblets beside each other. If you've ever gone hiking in the rain, you've noticed that typically doesn't happen. Uh, and so you get a different pattern uh, of, of upslope contributing area when you use this method. And there are many, many papers that have argued that this method is the best. Uh, but in part, that's because uh, Carbottom uh, has been very good at first promoting his own software product, PowerDem, that, that, that gives a person a way to implement this, and in convincing other people like Esri to put his algorithm in their product. So there's eight or 10 different software systems where you could implement uh, this particular idea. And then these two characters uh, a few years ago came up with the idea that you could use this so-called D-infinity, which was the Tarbotten approach, but you didn't need to limit it to be a single flow direction algorithm. In certain circumstances, it could be multiple. The classic case of where that would be, imagine I'm walking along a ridgeline. Chances are the ridgeline is going to divide a grid cell, right? The, the center cell in my three by three window. On my left side, the water's flowing downhill that way. And on this side, the water's flowing downhill the other way. Right? Those errors are going to be reproduced in every single calculation if you get that moment wrong. Right? With a single flow routing algorithm, you can't go in opposite directions both sides. And so these guys were arguing there's a simple solution, just expand his, his fundamental idea of calculating these flow vectors so that in a single calculation there could be multiple, right? And then implement that, right? And when you do that, you you get a map that looks pretty pretty similar, uh, but if we were to analyze it, you know, grid cell by grid cell, we'd find some differences, uh, typically around the, the ridge line that marks the edge of this cattle, right? Now, the other thing is the typical output for people like me is a, is a map like this, right? And so the whole field uh, relies on, on visual outcomes and looking at products uh, visually uh, in so many of the papers. And here's the latest idea, uh, a, a different idea. So these guys in Sweden, very, very clever. So they divide every grid cell into nine triangles. And so they start with, with elevation data that's square grid, but they do all of their analysis to calculate flow directions and then flow accumulation using triangles. So a triangulated irregular network, and then they have uh, a series of, of rules uh, that depending on, on how they interpret the change in elevation across these, to form these triangles, where water either stays or it moves or it's split. And then you implement those rules over every grid cell, over whatever area you want, and you uh, you can end you end up then with a, a new representation of, of what wetness uh, or flow accumulation would look like on that landscape. Uh, these guys, uh, I guess, because I publish their papers in transactions and GIS, when I asked them for their their method, uh, they sent me a little executable, and so with my own DM, I could I could run their method in about five or ten minutes for that study area in Montana, and so there's the outcome. Right now, I I've not had the opportunity though to think about or uh, how how they coded this uh, or whether it actually produces the desired outcomes. The description of it's pretty complicated. And that result looks a lot like the previous one. They all look a lot like the previous <laughs> one, and so uh, I think it's only when you get to thinking about site-specific landscape characteristics that it even matters. So uh, I think the problem is that many of the applications rely on knowing something about specific locations in order to make decisions uh, relative to those locations. And so while they all have the same general pattern, the devil's in the details, right? Uh, so now go back here to the software. Uh, just the flow routing, the flow direction algorithms I've shown you 
some of them are actually implemented in all of these systems here. Some of them are only implemented in two or three, some in only one, right? And some are standalone packages you have to get from the author in uh, none of these systems. And so there's not much work, for example, about whether or not a particular method implemented inside ArcGIS is the same method, even though it, it reportedly is from the documentation, as the one implemented in QGIS. Uh, I'm actually the co-author of a couple of these flow direction algorithms, and much to my surprise when I was writing my book, I saw that my, my algorithms were implemented in this, this system called Saga. Uh, and, I, and then I looked up who, who authored this system, and I thought, well, I've never met them. Never, never, never written to me, and to the best of my knowledge, I never gave anybody ever my code. <laughs> and so, from my description of my code, they reauthored the code. And I don't know whether they'd be smarter than me if they could do that in exactly the same way I first wrote the code, right? And typically, to your answer, uh, people don't test this on real landscapes. Uh, at least the flow direction algorithms, what they've done is to pick a series of, of shapes and model how that algorithm would direct water across uh, one of these surfaces. Uh, and, and, and the argument has been that, that, that these are perfectly known, and so you know the perfect outcome, right? Uh, now, the real world has lots of complications. It's got things sitting on the surface. Plants, buildings, roads, uh, ch changes in the character of the surface uh, because of what we've done. So, for example, if you're in a forest and there's a and there's a route that's used for logging trucks, then that soil will all be compacted and all be beat down. And so, when it rains, the tire tracks is where it's going to get wettest the fastest, and that's both a function of the elevation change but also what's happened to the soil, right? Uh, in Los Angeles, in a different kind of work, uh, you only need to urbanize about 8% of the landscape uh, to produce uh, urban hydrology. And part of that is because when you look at all the hills around Los Angeles, there's not much vegetation, but there's a lot of rock outcrops. And so there's a lot of the natural surface around the LA Basin that's impermeable, just like the urban landscape tends to be impermeable. And that's why we have these big debris flows and why we need all of these uh, uh, dams and, and debris basins to collect all of that sediment. Because even without 20 million people here, this is a very dynamic geomorphic landscape. Uh, and it's, it's got to do with the character of the surface. OK, so now other people have been thinking about these ideas of replicability and reproducibility uh, in, the, in the context of the geospatial sciences, of which I'm part. Institute I run is named after this. And so currently there's no formal framework that, uh, that would describe forms of failure to replicate uh, different people's work. Uh, not clear for the most part in what areas of geospatial research is the danger of non-replicability most severe, what mechanisms can be used to avoid or minimize the danger of such failures. Uh, do we expect the results of model calibrations to be constant over space? Uh, I'm guessing not. And if not, what are the implications for spatial analysis? Probably serious. Uh, how should R and R be incorporated into the design and implementation of future spatial software? I don't think there's too many people seriously thinking about that. Uh, how should students be made aware of these issues, and what follow-on activities might draw greater attention to these issues? And some other uh, earth science communities uh, at conferences, they have run uh, kind of competitions where maybe there's eight or 10 modeling groups that have all got different methods for achieving a certain outcome. So they invite all eight or 10 to the conference, they give them a standard data set, and then they ask them to do some work with that data set to produce a prescribed set of outcomes. And then they sit around for a couple of days and sort of do a compare and contrast. In this domain here, I'm not aware that anybody's ever done even something uh, like that. And in general, in the geospatial sciences, that's not a very common uh, approach. So let me try to set this in a, in a broader scene so you can see what other, some other people are doing. So mostly about opportunities and not so much about needs. So uh, 
uh, it's in in GIS in particular, uh, most people uh, are quite accustomed to thinking about metadata, but they think about it in a very narrow context. When was the code or the data set authored? Uh, how many people have changed it? Uh, what's the geographic resolution? What's the geographic extent? Uh, there's, there's not much about what kinds of decisions were made in order to produce the data set, uh, like answers to all those questions that I showed you earlier. Uh, and going forward, I think that that's going to be required, right? Uh, and many, many, many groups around the world now have published uh, data sets that describe land surface parameters, in some cases for the whole globe, in many cases for individual countries. And, and with little or no documentation. So you, you don't know which flow direction algorithm they used. You don't necessarily know what, what elevation source data they started with. You don't know what pre-processing they did with those data, et cetera, et cetera. And so in that sense, it's wild, wild west. Uh, but there are people that have been thinking about this more carefully. And so this group here is the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which uh, I sometimes hang out with. Uh, they used, uh, uh, a series of about 50 or 70 previously published works, and they used uh, some formalization and reasoning methods on, on, top of, on top of those papers to automatically derive uh, the rules that you would use to extract drainage networks from a digital elevation model, right? Uh, and so, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only paper that in this domain has been published that sort of taken that kind of approach. So you're taking the work of 50 or 70 groups that have already published papers and their descriptions of what they had to do in order to prepare the data and the methods to execute and produce their results, one of which was the extraction of the drainage network. And so they used an automated approach to try and crowdsource uh, the optimal solution uh, from all those decisions and so forth that were made. Can I ask a quick clarification? Yep. So uh, if I understand it uh, correctly, they are sort of reverse engineering from the output data, the process that generated yes. it. Yeah. And did they actually ask to the others whether that was the correct I don't correct think so. Right. Uh, so we don't know how accurate is this automatic pipeline. It might be perfectly accurate. You don't need any extra work or it might be completely wrong. I doubt, I doubt it's completely wrong, but some, you know, yeah, not, not uh, but extracting drainage networks is a is a pretty popular test because it's one of the few things about the land surface that you could you could uh, estimate independently of the kinds of workflows I'm talking about because from the satellite you could either see the water running down the streams or you could see the channel, right? Uh, but to the point about somebody's point about time here. Uh, many, many channels in the world don't have water all of the time, right? Uh, and the channel is really part of the, the, the landscape's ability to store water as well as move water, right? Uh, so that, that's why they pick something like this. And so here there's some greys and some reds. Uh, the, red, the reds are the results from the reasoning and the, and the greys are the parts of the network that were part of the original description that their automated method did, wasn't capable of picking up. Uh, but it's a, I'll, I'll even come back to that example in a second. Uh, second observation I'd have is that we, we should rediscover and use what we already know. So <clears throat> sometimes people ask me, you've got a PhD in geography, why does it matter? So here's an example of why it might matter. Uh, if we were just thinking of Marina del Rey, we don't need to worry about which datum is used to describe the Earth uh, as, a, as a model. And we don't need to worry about probably the map projection, right? We could just use some a planar system to record uh, distances and, and describe locations. If we're describing the whole of the globe, uh, we can't use a planar system because uh, the globe is actually shaped like a basket. Maybe not everybody agrees with that. We're still a flat earth society. Uh, <laughs> but for the most part, we're pretty comfortable now with the idea that, that those people are wrong. 
right? Uh, so think about taking a flat sheet of paper uh, or a series of flat sheets of paper and your, your raise at the end of the year is going to be determined whether or not you completely surround a basketball with flat sheets of paper with no overlaps, no folds or anything else, clearly impossible. And yet uh, most DMs come uh, with, a, with a standard uh, facing, 30 metres, 10 metres, 5 metres. And there are published papers where people have done global analysis using a five meter DM, where they describe that there are this many rows and this many columns to describe the surface of the earth. It's, it's painfully untrue, right? There might be that many grid cells, but the grid spacing at the equator cannot be the same grid spacing as, as the poles, right? So if you ever, if you're like atlases, most times in an atlas, the North and South Pole are left out and they have their own separate pages because you need a map projection that looks directly down on the poles to be able to adequately describe the area between, say, 70 degrees north or 70 degrees south of the South North Pole, right? You could do all of this work once you got to a certain geographic extent using uh, degrees of latitude and longitude. You don't need a, a a projection and a coordinate system in order to do that work. Uh, and the best papers, of course, do this. And there's this one gentleman, Igor uh, Florinsky in Russia, uh, who's, who's demonstrated many, many times uh, what needs to be done, but there are still people that somehow don't find his articles, even though the International Journal of Geographical Information Science is the leading journal in the world in this field. So that's number two. Number three, there's still people that are doing interesting things. Most of these things I've been talking about are scale dependent. Meaning if you pick 30 meters or you pick 10 meters or you pick one meter, at one particular point, you're likely to get three completely different answers, right? And, and so what we really need are methods uh, that, that, that work through a series of scales. And here's an example of of where a group have been calculating uh, traverse and profile terrain curvature. So curvature is important because uh, it'll tell you how energy is distributed in a landscape and whether or not as you go downhill, energy is accumulating or whether it's been constrained. So water is either going to uh, collect and flow even faster or it's going to slow down and spread out. Uh, and, and these guys a few years ago published a paper in which they argued that their calculations uh, can work at every scale and you can relate uh, how the, the estimates are going to change across a range of scales within their calculation method. Uh, these guys, a uh, group in Korea, uh, have been looking at calculating the longitudinal profile inside a stream because that's going to determine once the water gets to the stream, how fast it's going to vacate the landscape. Now, what traditionally people do is they, they take the digital elevation data that you get from USGS or some other source, and the very first thing they do is they find all of, they do a, a surface analysis and they find all of the, set, the, the grid points for which the eight surrounding points are higher, so they've got a pit or a depression, and then they fill those because that's going to mess up their ability to move water across the landscape, right? Uh, now, some of those might be artifacts of your data collection, but many of them are probably real, right? And, and you've eliminated those. And, and the, the chances that that's a problem, that you're going to do that, are, are higher at the bottom of the landscape than at the top. So if you're all set to calculate the longitudinal profile of the bottom half of a river or a stream, you, their argument is, well, would have been dumb to fill all of the depressions first because the rate of elevation change in the bottom part of a stream, like on the creek out here, is tiny, right? Back in Silver Lake where it started, there's still a, a little bit of a slope there, so it's not so, such an important issue. But most rivers, the first half, great change in elevation. The last half, little or no change in elevation. It's just the water being driven across the landscape. And, and so here's, here's their attempt to do that. They, 
data with this area here, they went to there, and over here they've got two or three different ways to do this. And if you take out the depressions first, you get a completely different answer than if you didn't. 95% of all the papers ever published in this field uh, worked on top of a depressionless DEM. They, they, that was their first pre-processing step. Uh, for some outcomes, it doesn't matter. Or even just trying to understand uh, measuring distance uh, across the top of a landscape. Uh, here's some work from Colorado uh, where they took different methods and turns out you get different answers, right? Sometimes they just take distance, they write as the horse runs, but sometimes people say as the crow flies. And uh, they don't take account of the fact that you walk up and down, up one side of a hill and down the other side. That dramatically changes the distance, right? Uh, and not everybody does that. Another thing that's typically missing is that uh, most people do this work without thinking about the theory. And so here's a, a group that have uh, recently published a paper, which the hardest thing to find about a stream network is where's the, where does the stream start in the landscape, right? This might be important if you've got some concern about the water quality, because you need to be able to trace the water right back to the source. You have any hope of understanding why the quality is not what you want it to be. And this, this particular group here have used uh, uh, something called stream power uh, to try and estimate where that occurs, uh, as opposed to some arbitrary set of rules or heuristics that traditionally people have used. And, and here's a group in Montana who are basically looking, say, for every, why, why when it rains, what controls how much runoff comes in different kinds of rainstorms? And their hypothesis was that it had something to do with the connection in the shallow groundwater between the side of the hill, the riparian area next to the channel and the channel itself. And so their argument was that when you're thinking of, of how landscapes respond to events like a big rainstorm, there's a series of sort of nested hierarchical controls that have a huge influence on the behavior of the system. And so they took a whole bunch of natural rainstorms over some number of years in, in this one watershed in Montana and demonstrated that if you could characterize that shallow groundwater system, then you had an excellent chance to predict what happened in virtually every storm that had fallen during that period. And that the, the, the outcome on that particular part of the landscape might be completely different than somewhere else just because you could characterize the the low surface behavior uh, and, and organization of both the groundwater and the materials. Uh, the other point is that now that everybody's interested in global change, uh, notice that all of my examples were of a tiny little watershed in Montana with a map, right? Uh, you know, I do what I do because as a kid, I love maps. Uh, and I still love maps. I have maps on my office wall. I have uh, maps in New Zealand. It's actually a, it was a T-shirt that I then stretched and put on a frame. Uh, but for modeling, maps not so useful, right? Uh, and so uh, many of these parameters need to be conceptualized and used as distributions, right, in global models. And uh, uh, making a map and then trying to extract that information from a map uh, is an unnecessary step, which may cost you uh, both elegance as well as uh, precision and accuracy. And, and not many people have, have thought about this uh, seriously today, largely because they, they think, I think it's impossible, right? But I, I know with some of the tools and kinds of work that you all do that I think for you this might be low hanging fruit. There's also uh, attempts, back to maps for a second, to developing and embracing new visualization methods. So, you know, if you want to zoom into a map uh, and look at a very small area in a great deal of detail, and then in another instance, you want to roll out and see the whole United States, the whole of North America, or the whole of the world, uh, how are you controlling the content of the map uh, in doing that? Uh, traditionally, that was done by individual people drawing maps at different scales and extents. Uh, but it turns out you can use a, a data-driven approach to do that, and you could 
you could use data to make decisions about what to generalize, what to keep, and so forth when you're doing that. And what people want in my field want now uh, with 3D printing is they want to be able to touch this and imagine it. And, uh, and you know, in public hearings and public meetings, uh, it turns out that the early evidence is that this really gets people excited and engaged in thinking about what they want their, their landscape to be like, right? Uh, I, I typically every Saturday morning go to a farmer's market and for the last month I get free apples because the guy I buy apples from, his boss, who has an apple orchard on the side of the Sierra Nevada mountains in, near Bakersfield, he wants to produce a 3D model of his apple farms. Apparently he's got multiple and he wants, to, he wants one just for this for this big place where he entertains guests. He wants one that's portable that he can take with him to the planning commission for when he wants to argue for changes in water use or water rights or whatever else. And then he wants little tiny ones that he could give to important people as gifts. Uh, right. And uh, apparently, uh, since I put him in touch with some companies and people that can make these, that, that I've so far had a couple of turns at free apples. Right. And then uh, the last thing to say is that sometimes the impossible becomes possible. So to your point about, well, is there ways to validate this? In, in real world landscapes, it's been problematic because there's not been enough sort of theory based calculations, right? But one thing that can be calculated is that you can estimate the specific catchment area from first principles using a differential equation. And these two characters that I've worked with a lot over the last 30 years, Mike Hutchinson and John Galan, as little ago as 2011, published a paper which demonstrated that there is an equation for calculating this using first principles, but they thought it was so computationally difficult that you'd only ever do it once, one time. And therefore that would be just the, oh, the gold standard. Now, again, my colleagues in Chinese Academy of Sciences have now demonstrated that in fact, uh, there are efficient methods that you can uh, calculate this uh, any place, everywhere uh, in, in a reasonable time with relatively modest computer resources. And so we stand right at the beginning of a period when in fact, you could, we could do what you're arguing for, that there would be a way to skip those uh, four sort of model surfaces and go to real landscapes with any and all of these methods and in many instances compare them to what theory tells us the landscape is organized like and how it how it should form. And so to close, uh, there's lots of opportunities here, uh, but they would require domain scientists as well as uh, people with superior uh, reasoning and computational skills. Uh, and the holy grail here is to be able to produce uh, actionable knowledge, right? And so an example of this is the US national water model. Uh, it was basically produced uh, over about a four year period by a group of scholars from across the country and with summer schools where graduate students were brought to all places, I think to Alabama. I think the new national water center is at the University of Alabama. And uh, an example of what the impact of that might mean is that prior to that, the, the National Weather Service and the United States Geological Survey uh, could not reliably estimate flood hazard uh, for most of the US coastline. That's where 100 million of the three or 400 million people in the United States live. There was no data-driven process that would enable you in real time to generate flood forecasts. So most of the rest of the country, you could generate flood forecasts for maybe areas that were 5,000 square kilometers in size. So you're gonna have a lot of false positives. Nope, the weather forecasts, everybody's got to evacuate. You evacuate 20 times, the house never got wet. So what am I gonna do the 21st time? I agree, I'm just gonna stay pat. Not gonna, not gonna cause me any harm. Uh, it might kill you, as, as we've seen in the, Southeast in the last couple of big storms, right? And so 
basically what we have is now a, a national water model that, that provides very fine spatial temporal predictions uh, down to the local level, right? Because there are occasions when public safety put their own workers in harm's way because prior to this, they had no ability to know how fast or how much a, a local stream was going to rise uh, during a big, a big storm event. Uh, and, and there's no excuse for that now, other than the fact that you've got to communicate this, this geophysical knowledge now in terms that people understand to thousands of people. Uh, and, and I think that's the hardest part of that. And the other one would be, all across the world, uh, one of the great problems with water is still the ways in which people use it and cause the quality to deteriorate. Agriculture is not the only, but it's a big, big culprit here. Uh, and, uh, and so what, what we need to be able to do is to describe the landscape so we can understand the, the likely consequences of using various forms of pesticides or fertilizer and what that would mean for both the land itself and any water bodies that are connected to it. Right? And then we, we can't hope to solve those problems and sustain food supply and public safety and so forth without making better use of the kinds of knowledge that I've been talking about. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, we are kind of bit over time, but I yep. think if there are a couple of additional questions, otherwise, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any work on moving these two-dimensional topological maps to voxels, so rather than pixels volume? Uh, I'd like to say yes, but I. In my book, I probably have about 45 pages of reference. And I don't I don't know that I remember a single paper that I read to write the early book uh, that used voxels, right? Uh, now, there's plenty of papers, say, about groundwater systems that use voxels. But most of this kind of work is typically about what's happening immediately on or just under the surface of the earth. Right. Right. Even describing uh, the surface, you talk about some problems of yes. you know, traversing one one cube, whether yep. you're traversing from the top or yes. along the slope. Yep. I feel like voxels would be a way to kind of integrate all of those things. Yep. Yep. Probably excellent idea. Right. The other thing is that the land surface, you know, most of these methods think of the land surface as continuous. And in many respects, the, 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 there's always times when the land surface is not continuous. Think of some something like the Grand Canyon, <laughs> right? And so, you know, things like cliffs and so forth uh, tend to cause the kinds of people that, that, that write about and use these kinds of methods a great deal of difficulty. And computationally, there's, there's really no excuse for that anymore. Perhaps, you know, when, when most of this, had, the founding work here was done, it, it was a huge problem. Uh, even in a, even for a analog map, what to do with cliffs was always a, a big problem, right? Because uh, contour lines were supposed to show the change in elevation, and for a vertical cliff, uh, you would have 20 lines superimposed on top of each other that nobody could see, right? Yep. So uh, a little bit more. You know, higher level. Where yes. do you see the biggest needs for computing uh, and uh, uh, you know computational uh, approach? And of course, the sort of the flip side of is like where do you see the biggest opportunities? Uh, well, it depends on your aspirations, and it depends on your times, your kind of time span, right? So I think. Uh, I think the one opportunity, the most immediate opportunity would be to, uh, I think there's an opportunity now to sort of put together and, and take for a spin with real landscapes, uh, many, many seemingly competing methods to achieve outcomes, right? And so you might be able to build the momentum for uh, future work to coalesce around 
maybe a subset of better versus worst methods, right? Uh, I think the computational resources to do that, given today's sort of back end, is, is, that seems to me to be low hanging fruit. Uh, what traditionally hasn't happened is that the, the kinds of people that are interested in this kind of work don't seem to be well connected to the people that, that for example, could, can easily think about and, 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 and implement and use Voxel, right? Uh, uh, or, you know, for methods of formalism and case-based reasoning and these kinds of things, because I think with, with those kinds of tools, we could make a lot of progress uh, relatively quickly. Uh, the second and maybe the longer term challenge is, is to be able to connect these things to kind of real world outcomes that people care about, right? And with some level of reliability or optimism about how, how well you think you've answered the question, right? Most of these people here, when they think of precision and accuracy, they their, their yardstick is, is they want perfect precision and accuracy and sort of my counterpoint would be, you know, people have been hugely successful in this world working with high levels of uncertainty. If any of us in this room have a partner in life or had a partner that we don't have anymore, uh, in both cases, marriage and divorce or getting together and splitting, those decisions were made under a high level of uncertainty, right? And for many people, it works out just fine. Right, and so you know why in other aspects of our life, you know, if we think if we use a particular pesticide on our landscape, that's going to put pesticide or some derivative of the pesticide in a, a lake with 12,000 summer cottages. We, we should be able to decide pretty quickly uh, with some, some imperfect knowledge and evidence whether or not that that was a good idea. Right, uh, and so I think there's a, a lot of work like that. So the Buchanan thing, for example, I showed you with the 400 different combinations. Uh, I think, for example, that was probably a three to five year project funded at some considerable amount of money by the United States Department of Agriculture, if I remember correctly. Uh, and, and, and that's that's maybe the best paper of its kind that I've seen published in the world, meaning it considered the most the most, of, the most different combinations of those things, and it did it in a landscape where you, you had, there was something important that you could learn about that landscape as a consequence of, of doing that work. But it, but it seems to me with, with computational tools, you, you could do that many times over, right? You could, you could develop a method and then let people use it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.